So we're ready to start our block number 12, um, and it's called The Art of the Game. So I would like to welcome to the stage our moderator, Maurizio Vinello. And big applause, thank you. And he's going to be joining us along with David Johansson, Garib Shamus, Roberto Regada. <laughs> oh my God, you have a lot of fans out there. Jonathan Teplitsky and Sebastian Raduso. Let's get started. All right. So I have with me David Johansson, and uh, he, I mean, I present him for his main games, Block Lords, although he also fa is founder of, of, a, of a platform in reality, the Escape Networks. Gareb, who is a, a, a comic celeb, but is here for a, his Web3 platform. Uh, Sebastian Banger, Jonathan Pipeflare, and Roberto Halborn. So four platform and an audit form. So a little bit of technical things maybe at the end of this. Um, so I never dreamt I'd host a gaming panel because last time I played a game, it was 1993. It was Doom. <laughs> so I wonder why I, I'm here, and then maybe it's because of my blockchain experience more than my experience as a player. In the last, uh, for the last four years, I met uh, many companies trying to map their ideas, their uh, applications onto a, a blockchain. And I have to say that of all the use cases that I studied, that I met, the one that makes the most sense is gaming. And that is because games create a fully digital world. And fully digital worlds can be really decentralized. Also, I think that the concept of tokens existed already in games in the 80s, in the 70s even. With arcade games, we had gold bars, we had digital characters. So in a way, we can think about Web3 as an evolution of, of that very concept. Having said that, I'm happy that we have some world-class experts here that, can, that also can, can drive the, the gaming side of this. And I'd like to start with David. David, you've been a, a developer, first of all, before becoming a founder. Now, even if I always think about, because of my background, first about the protocol and about the backend, I know that it's the user experience that really makes a difference between success or not in a game. So maybe you can tell us and this audience, um, how Web3 is really redesigning, redefining the experience of players. Yeah, happy to. I mean, first off, thanks for having us here. It's really a great conference and a great panel. Uh, yeah, what I can say, having been making games for the last 10 years, been in entertainment for the last 15, and working on NFT gaming since I started playing Crypto Kitties back in December 2017, uh, really what Web3 brings to the table is, is the ability for users to actually own and define their experiences in game and then can do whatever they want with that asset, right? So looking at Web3 and defining the user journey from, from a player just entering a game and like you said, interacting with a currency, whether that's a resource, like in Block Lords, you know, our users, they are farming wheat and they're building out their farms and they're getting these resources, these currencies that they can then exchange for other currencies build out their might, build out their Web3 assets, their NFTs, and then as they're growing through the ecosystem, they're able to truly look at their assets and say, hey, I own this, I created this, I made it happen, and now I can share my experience in the game with other users. And that's really the power of Web3. I agree, I agree that the, the ownership, the ability to develop, to transfer is really key. And so, Garib, so I said Garib is a celebrity with the, in, 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 the, in the comic book world. And uh, I mean, I, had, I studied you a little bit. And uh, I discovered that he invented the concept of, of Comic Cons. Comic Cons for us Europeans are conferences where, where fans meet their superheroes. And, uh, and I mean, they didn't exist, and, and you invented that. And also, Garib uh, uh, founded some magazines that became worldwide uh, successes. But, of course, you're not here for, the, for that, but because you have your own platform, Hero, Hero Maker uh, uh, Studios. And, um, and I know we spoke uh, yesterday, I, I know that you have some strong opinions about some of the existing NFT, some of the existing NFT projects there. Maybe you can share that with the audience and see 
how we react. Oh, absolutely. So uh, amazing to be here. And yes, I've been in the superhero business my entire life. Um, and to me, everything revolves around the hero's journey. You know, so everything, every time you go to a film or watch a TV show, you know, it's always being on somebody else's journey. And for the first time, you know, the fans can be on their own personal journey. And that's why gaming is great, because it's all about that. Um, but what we've also seen a lot is that there's a very big distinction between what I call digital collectibles and Web3. You know, and so many companies that we see, especially the big IP holders, you know, they're never going to turn over their IP for the fans and the ownership way. You know, the big media companies, the big superhero franchises that you see, no matter how many NFTs they offer to people to engage, it's always going to be in their universe and it's never going to be in the fans' best interest. Whereas Web3 is all about ownership and we created Hero Maker as a way to do world building so that we can create these incredible worlds and individual franchises that people can then own characters in our worlds and build alongside of us. Think about like, um, you know, um, you know, uh, open source IP that people could build along. My entire life has been, you know, working with fans and being part of that maker community and being a part of that. So that's where, to me, Web3 is going. Um, and a lot of the NFTs that you see out there, you know, a lot of these big media companies are doing. I mean, it's, it's NFTs, but it's really not the, what Web3 was invented for. Thanks very much. So I think we agree in, in, yeah, in the reality. Totally. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, Sebastian, so uh, yesterday when, when, you, when we spoke and, and you told me that Banger is about eSport, you know, you opened a new world to me. It's like... Uh, so esports for the, the few of us that are you know of, uh, of a different age, it's a, it's a sport where, where where sport is replaced by games and the athletes are are now game players, and it's possible to build a, a meta game where you create a game and environment incentives, and where the data comes from the, the games that is being played. So maybe we can start from that one because maybe for some of the audiences that is a new concept, maybe not. Be, you know, good to hear also your vision. Sure, I I think I'm the only one here that doesn't develop games. So <laughs> Banger is a platform, uh, a Web3 platform for Web2 games. What does that mean exactly? You play a game like Call of Duty, FIFA, Counter Strike, or any kind of other game out there. And we offer you a reward, an objective and reward mechanism that is recognized in our platform. Now, esports is the competitive uh, understanding of video games. That means that you want to rank yourself against other people, right? And that self achievement can be measured individually within a team or, or you know, within the community itself. Now, what we are trying to do with Banger is to be as agnostic as possible to all the game titles out there, either those being Web 2 or Web 3, regardless of the platform, whether it's PC, console, or mobile. Thanks very much. And Jonathan, we've, um, I mean, we've known each other for, uh, for some time. We work together. And uh, um, I mean, Jonathan has got an impressive marketing background. So I think it's interesting to explore with you a little bit uh, this interesting combo that is marketing and games. And I think maybe a good starting point could be brands, because I think that games could possibly help uh, brand engagement. Do you agree? And if so, how? Yeah, so Maurizio, thank you. Uh, good question. So I'm really lucky. I get to work with a lot of brands. And so I have a little bit of a different perspective on games, because we don't go necessarily a direct to consumer we do games for businesses so I'll give you one example of a game that we're exploring with one of our clients I think that might demonstrate the point so uh, we have a client named Bolero uh, Bolero owns about uh, 500 bowling alleys in the United States and they own the professional bowling association so the the PBA is like the NFL of bowling so they have all the champions and things like this um, and they're exploring how do they enter the metaverse in a way where people from all over the world can play bowling, whether it's in VR or AR or through mobile or through their console, but they're gonna be putting advertisements for uh, their bowling alleys inside of the game. So based on your IP address, not only can you play in the metaverse, but now you know where you can go to actually play with your friends. 
but it goes one layer deeper. So based on how you perform in the digital game, you can get rewards inside of their physical locations. So for example, if you score a perfect game in the metaverse, you might get a free pizza or a free pair of shoes at the actual bowling alley. And so this is really interesting because it's starting to tie the digital and the physical. And the cool part about working with brands is you have KPIs, uh, performance indicators that they're already monitoring. And so you can tie your marketing to indicators inside of their current business. And so that makes it really interesting and you're a lot less prone to these fluctuations in, in the bear market or bull market because they already have a business that's performing and they have their own marketing tools. So I'm really excited about that project. And I'm also seeing that, uh, you know, it's happening. I mean, I, recently there have been a lot of announcements also about brands and NFTs, you know, more and more big ones. And Starbucks, yesterday Starbucks. they announced, yeah. you know, their loyalty program, which is essentially going to be an NFT, a dynamic NFT, which is... And that's going know, to be huge also in terms of adoption. I think it, it will impact everyone in a way if, if a, that kind of large audience will, will get used to, yeah, owning, holding, moving NFTs. Thanks, Jonathan. Roberto, I mean, also we work together and we, we work together on the ApeCoin and other side launches and uh, Halborn and Roberto in particular work with us in, in uh, auditing the, the smart contracts. So up until now, we have assumed that everything works fine and is good. Unfortunately, in software, that's not always the case. And uh, with smart contracts, with, uh, in general, with blockchains, you can, you, you, it can be a really a disaster. You can really kill a project if you make um, mistakes. And maybe we can start, if you, if you want, to just take an example or, or a few examples or an example of, of vulnerabilities that uh, were exploited in the past. Or uh, yeah, sure. Uh, but first of all, the vulnerabilities are not only in the smart contracts, like as you must know, all the blockchain games uh, are running thanks to, thanks to smart contracts, right? And one little mistake in a, in a line of code in a smart contract can have like a very huge impact. But uh, talking about Web3 games, the, the biggest hack ever that happened related to the blockchain games was the hack uh, to Axie Infinity, to the running network. Uh, they lost like uh, 600 millions there. Uh, and actually, it was nothing related to the smart contracts. Basically, the attack was, uh, was related to, to a phishing. Uh, that phishing was developed by an APT group. And what did they do? Well, uh, they uh, created like uh, different um, job positions in LinkedIn. They contacted different engineers which were working in Axie Infinity. And they made them go through, through an interview process. And they actually... Uh, made them do different interviews. Everything was like quite real. And at the end of those interviews, they sent to some of the, of the employees a PDF. And that PDF was infected, and that's how they managed to get into their computers, steal the private keys, and after that, they managed to, to hack the bridge with the, with the private keys. So my point here is that we shouldn't really just focus in the smart contracts. The smart contracts are very, very important, but we really need to, to focus in everything that is around the game. Like, uh, in this case, the employees in the company, make sure that they follow the best security practices. Uh, we should make sure that all the socials are correctly uh, secure. Uh, all the Discord messages that are sent, make sure that there is no phishing in there. You know, so it's not only about the smart contracts, it's about everything, uh, everything related to, to, the, to the project that we should take, take care. Roberto, you managed to scare me. Really? <laughs> Thanks. Um, we have a few more minutes, and it would be good, uh, David, to hear a little bit more about Block Lords, because I think it's a great game. You have all these four areas there, and, you know, and I think it's a fantastic game, fantastic idea. Maybe you can spend some time. Yeah, thank you. I mean, uh, yeah, Block Lords really comes from my obsession with uh, medieval times and shows like Game of Thrones and games like Age of Empires and Total War. And really the idea is to create a Web3 game where you go through the entire medieval journey. You start off as a farmer, you work your land, you get, gather resources, you can tokenize those resources. 
You can get married with your NFT hero and have NFT children that are going to build out the legacy of your family. And as you rank, rise through the ranks, you can become a, a warrior, you can attack other farmers, you can become a lord and earn taxes from the farmers. And yeah, lots of medieval mayhem on the chain. Gonna check it out. <laughs> check it out. And uh, Gerb, so same question for you. You just launched uh, uh, your own series, uh, I think Kumite. Yes. Yeah. yeah, we launched uh, Kumite, which is an epic battle between heroes and villains. We created 24 different families of heroes and villains. But it wasn't just a linear story, it's actually three dimensional. So, right when in the storytelling side, we actually created a game mechanic built in. So, we have a vortex tournament going on right now where the community is voting on which family is the most powerful in the Kumite universe. And then, based on the results, we'll start our digital comic books that we're creating. And then that families that win will, will be the lead families in the comic book. And then we're also building out a trading card game, a paper-based first. But it's based on what's called a MOBA game, mobile online battle arena game, where people can pick heroes versus villains. So when eventually we want to go digital with it into the blockchain, we already have a mechanic that works. So everything that we're doing with our franchises and the characters that we're building, it's the fans will help determine where it goes, and then we get right into the gaming side of it. Very exciting. Thank you. And um, Sebastian, I, I read your white paper or light paper, and um, one thing that really hit me was the idea that in your vision, gaming is as important as literature uh, or art or music. And uh, so it has got an important place in today's world and the future world. Also, even more with more money in, in there. And your chief strategy officer with Banger. So, can you spend some time maybe detailing a little bit your vision and the vision of Banger? Sure. So, I would start with uh, the big numbers, right? We are discussing 3 billion gamers and a 200 billion industry, which is larger than cinema and music put together. And this has been like that for several years already. Now, as the young generations became more and more digital, they uh, natively understand how to behave in a digital world, right? So games became part of their lifestyle altogether. Now, when we looked at our own childhood or our parents and so forth, you know, it was all about physical interaction. So the social aspect of life was in person. Now, games syndicate people and throw them into uh, socialization by digital first they don't remove the physical aspect of it altogether. So as an industry, this is growing further and further. If we look back 12, 13, 14 years ago with the global financial crisis and so forth, that's when free to play was born. That's when digital streaming services were born, right? So you have a distinction between those playing games and those watching games. Right now we've been through this global crisis, this health crisis, that uh, kept people in their houses, right? And you could see like a almost 20% increase in the overall revenues of the industry itself. So games became more and more part of the day-to-day -day of each of the people. Now, at Banger, our ambition is to um, cover all the games out there and try to um, provide a, a way for the users to create digital wealth. Right now, as it is, they only spend time and money on games, right? And the way they use the games is for self-expression and self-representation inside the game universe. What we are trying to do is expand that across the board. And that means Web2 games as well as Web3 games. Thanks very much. Jonathan, you mentioned the, the how, um, you know, that games can be good for brand, for brand engagement, but what kind of games should, should brands deploy, or better said, what do users look for in a blockchain game? So we run a website called pipeflare.io with about 60,000 daily players. So I can speak to the data that we see from those players. Um, I think a, a big thing that makes games sticky is two things, and I'll say them pretty quickly. The first one is having good incentives. So as blockchain games get better, maybe the incentives can get lower. But right now, the reality is most blockchain games are played because of the incentives that are offered by the game. 
but also what we're seeing is users want interoperability. So we have seven games on our platform right now, and what they want is to be able to purchase an NFT in one game and then use it in the other games. So one of the things that we're doing in Q1 is offering NFTs that you can win for game A, but you can only win it in game B. So this makes it sticky because you need to play the other games on the platform in order to get something for someone else. And so I think it's up to people uh, like who are attending this conference to kind of partner together and see how can we make our games interoperable because that's what real users are really looking for going forward. Now you might have a, a really great game where users don't want interoperability because there's so much inside of it, but not everyone has a studio that can create such an amazing product. Most games will be like Flappy Birds or Super Mario Brothers or something of a more simple level, and that's where that interoperability will take a simple game and make it something really special. I agree, and I think it's also in line with uh, what we heard from Rob about blockchains becoming commodities at some point, and these layers on top of that will will have to somehow communicate. Roberto, one one last question. So, what kind? Of vulnerabilities do you typically find? What are the typical vulnerabilities that you see? And any advice to some of the developers that are also in this audience when approaching? Okay, so I'm gonna do a talk about that in like 30 minutes, so feel free to join. It's not about only Web3 games, but about smart contracts in general. But one of the things that I'm going to mention there is that the most common bugs that you're going to find in any kind of project, including gaming projects, are logic errors. Like the, the more complex that the project is, the, the higher likelihood of finding a logical error there. So that's the most common error that you can find. Uh, another one, for example, is that usually blockchain games really need to generate random numbers. Like, let's say that uh, you finish a quest, right? And you, are, you, you must you know, uh, give a reward to the, to the users for, for completing that, that quest. So, there are multiple rewards, and you really need to somehow choose uh, which rarity the reward is going to be. And to do that, you uh, usually a smart contracts generate a random number, but you cannot really do that on chain. But some gaming projects do that on chain, and you know, generating a random number on chain, as I just said, is not possible. So sometimes that opens uh, multiple possibilities to, to for users or for an attacker to exploit that, and always get, let's say, the the rarest eaten of the game after completing a quest, or things similar to, to that. Thanks a lot, and uh, we are at time. I hope uh, that we've learned something. I certainly did. What I know and that I'm sure is that this sector is going to explode for sure. Thanks.